Bingo, it's Marco and me and maybe Mina, but maybe not on Friday, on Friday, not Monday. So uh, we're talking about energy. This is one of our most important shows. It's all about energy. And we have Marco on the line, Marco Mangelsdorf uh, from ProVision Solar in Hilo, where they know, they know about energy in Hilo. We get a perspective from him that's fabulous. Welcome again to the show, Marco. Well, Jay, aloha, happy Friday, actually from the friendly Isle of Molokai here, where I'm here for this week doing some solar work and soaking in all those good Molokai vibes in, in, uh, in response to the uh, rather momentous uh, election results of the past days. So, uh, my greetings to you, sir. Yeah, what do the people on Molokai think about uh, Donald J. Trump? Well, I can't say I've gone and done any type of uh, man-on-the-street interviews or polling, so I'm, uh, I'll have to get back to you on that. <laughs> okay, get back to us on that. Uh, well, you know, I guess the, the primary question that's in everybody's mind, um, you know, is the effect of uh, Trump on, on whatever your favorite topic is. I mean, we have a show coming up, uh, Trump's effect on, um, on diplomatic relations around the world. We have had discussions about Trump's effect on sustainability and uh, uh, efforts to ameliorate climate change. I mean, everybody, through the lens of their particular specialty, is looking at how the world is going to change because of DJT. And of course, energy, which is a big initiative, which in must involve federal action, uh, which must involve national, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure it's must, but which probably should involve federal governmental action. How is that going to change because of the election of DJT, a man who is not at all sure about climate change or, for that matter, um, um, fossil fuels? So um, are we going back to coal? Is that what you're saying, Marco? Well, let me let me take this approach, Jay, kind of from the top down. Uh, there's going to be, of course, uh, a scramble over the course of the next uh, couple months to determine who the cabinet level positions will be and one of the cabinet level positions will be the uh, the who's in charge of the department of energy the u.s department of energy and that person will be able to kind of be the captain of the the ship so to speak in terms of what the federal government under mr trump a focus and priorities will be and so what what will those focus foci and priorities be and uh, there's going to be a lot of uh, a lot of speculation and kind of trying to read the tea leaves and what as he said in the past and I think overall what appears to to those of us who have been paying attention to what he has said regarding energy and and those who he associates with uh, what their position is on on energy issues is that I think it's likely that uh, the push is going to be away from uh, more and more development of renewable energies, which certainly took place under has taken place under Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton was vowing as well to to continue that of net redouble uh, the efforts towards renewable energy, and there will be a renewed focus uh, under his administration on on conventional energy sources and you know some some data here might be uh, might be good uh, uh, a good segue to look at some of the numbers so looking at uh, total energy US energy consumption by energy source in 2009 about uh, seven years ago the breakdowns in terms of the primary energy sources there were five of them the, the, the biggest one was petroleum at 37 percent of all US energy consumption by source 37 percent for for oil 25 percent natural gas 21 percent coal nine percent nuclear and then eight percent renewable energy so that was when essentially when Obama took office uh, looking at 2015 by energy source 2015 petroleum went down slightly from 37 to 36 natural gas over that Did you say one went point up from down that's all just one point down correct that's not correct very impressive at all not dramatic. Uh, natural gas, however, went down, or went up, excuse me, from 25% in 2009 to 29%, 25 to 29% in the course of six years. Coal went down from 21% to 
to 16 percent, or five five points total. Nuclear stayed the same at nine, and then renewable energy went up from eight percent in 2009 to 10 percent in 2015. So he certainly, Mr. Trump, stated on a number of occasions when he was talking to coal miners or people who were supportive of coal mining in uh, places like Kentucky, West Virginia, and so forth, that he was he was going to uh, you know bring back the coal industry. And to what extent he's able to do that, I think, is really highly doubtful in the sense that the reason coal has taken such a hit is because it's been out outpriced uh, by lower uh, competitive sources of energy, principally petroleum, and but especially natural gas. So, I mean, there are market forces that go beyond the ability of any chief executive, no matter how, how high an office they may have, uh, to be able to, uh, to simply by the wave of a magic wand, revivify an industry that has been overtaken by market forces uh, in terms of cheaper energy sources displacing, in this case, coal. So, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll let me add one other and... factor is that you have to have certain coal infrastructure to burn coal. And as coal shrinks and as other mm, sources of energy come online, uh, whoever the capital concentration is, they're putting less money into coal infrastructure. So even if he really meant it when he said it, even if he really means to follow through on that as a campaign um, you know, promise to the people in, in the coal belt, um, and even if the market um, you know, would, would price it out so it was still attractive, the fact is the infrastructure probably isn't ready for an increase in coal. So, you know, that promise, I wouldn't count on that promise at all. Yeah. I think you're right, Jay. I think there's probably more wiggle room in terms of kind of macro policy from Washington or from the White House when it comes to, to oil. Uh, you can look at uh, the contortions that the Obama administration went through for years regarding the Keystone Pipeline, which eventually he, he nixed, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, it's uh, likely that that would be something that Mr. Trump would seek to uh, to reinstate, you know, full speed ahead in terms of being able to get the uh, oil sands, tar oil sands from, from Canada and move them down south, of, uh, you know, through the United States and to, uh, to a port in the Gulf of, of Mexico. So I think uh, for, for important infrastructure projects like that, he's probably going to move forward. And uh, regarding fracking, I mean, uh, I don't know if you you know this kind of a sidebar, but uh, if you look at what's been going on in Oklahoma over the past years, I mean, up until when uh, uh, fracking was not happening much in Oklahoma, which is a longtime oil producing state, but with, with the fracking, and it's not so much the fracking that has been causing all these earthquakes in Oklahoma, it's the injection of this uh, slurry of wastewater and chemicals, which apparently has been is demonstrably known now to be causing uh, a definite increase in earthquakes, some of them more damaging than others. But it, it would appear that when it comes to supporting the petroleum industry, that uh, having Mr. Trump in the White House is going to be tangibly better uh, and, and across the board for the petroleum industry than having Mr. Obama in the office. So I think that's something that we're likely to see uh, a, a tangible change. I don't recall Mr. Trump saying anything specifically regarding nuclear power, but he probably has, or I'm going to channel him and and, uh, and believe that he is in favor of more nuclear power, although that's a whole kind of different bailiwick in the sense of nuclear power plants can often take, without exaggeration, a decade or longer to go online. And I, I personally you mean as see long as TMT as then? I'm sorry? You mean as long as TMT? <laughs> yes, yes, as long as TMT. And, uh, and then regarding uh, renewable energy, I mean, uh, over the years, uh, there has been certain opposition, uh, typically on the right side of the political spectrum amongst Republicans, uh, who believe essentially that uh, wind and solar and other renewables have been unfairly and grossly subsidized by taxpayer money, uh, and that therefore that this is an industry that cannot survive with all these benefits, with all the, without all these incentives. And, of course, the reality is far different, which is, I mean, 
you look at the data which I have, it's just it's undeniable that if you look at over the past 50 or more years of government intervention into the energy sector, that the, the very uh, large beneficiaries have been the traditional energy industries, whereas renewables has been on the uh, kind of beggar thy neighbor, you know, sir, may I please have some more in my porridge bowl. In other words, renewable energy has received a hell of a lot less than conventional fuel sources in terms of incentives and subsidies. But, you, you know, the, the worst case scenario for, for my business and for the, the solar electric and renewable energy industry would be if a Republican occupants in the White House and Republican Congress were to essentially go after the investment tax credit, the ITC, which was just uh, a year or so ago renewed for another five years. I mean, and that can certainly be undone, just like, uh, you know, a top priority of, of Republicans, including Mr. Trump, is uh, to do away with Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act. So if they decide to go after the investment tax credit, which is a, a huge, huge, as he would say, uh, incentive uh, and benefit for the renewable energy industry. I mean, that would be uh, nothing but really, really bad news. But I, I have to believe that there is enough uh, support uh, on the Democratic side of the aisle and perhaps enough m amongst progressive Republicans that uh, the ITC would not be at risk. But, I mean, we're, we're just, what, all of three days away, right, Jay? Three days away from from the, re the results of Tuesday. But it, uh, it's... Uh, I, I think one thing is absolutely clear that this president uh, elect, once he's in office, is going to take a very different course when it comes to energy issues, both uh, domestic and international, compared to his uh, his predecessor and his predecessors. Yeah, it's not going to be enlightened. I mean, I think there are things where he made promises and made out outrageous brash statements in the campaign where he's probably going to relent just as a practical matter, because he's a practical man. <clears throat> but, in, you know, in the case of energy, I absolutely agree with you. Um, he's got a number of reasons to, um, to change the policy, change the Obama policy about renewables. Let me identify some of the things that come to my mind. Number one is, <clears throat> you know, the terrible thing in American politics is that always, you always have to follow the money. And uh, the capital concentration for oil is huge. Therefore, you know, despite his, um, you know, rejection of the establishment, which I, I think is a short-term rejection, he'll be back to the, to the establishment pretty quick. Um, the establishment, with all the money and oil, will have huge influence on him. <clears throat> the renewable uh, industry doesn't have as much money. They're not as large a capital concentration. They will not have a huge, uh, and, and they need government help to function. Uh, so they will not have a huge influence on him. Um, I'm not sure. I guess I, I would include in, in, in oil uh, uh, natural gas. And uh, I don't think he'd be real environmental about uh, what's happening in Oklahoma and their 800 annual earthquakes, which have been covered a number of times on 60 Minutes. So I don't, th I don't think Oklahoma is going to get relief from him. And I think he's, he's going, because of the capital involved, he's going to favor natural gas uh, along with... Um, along with uh, oil. We've already covered coal, so I, I, I think coal is problematic for him. Um, <clears throat> the other thing, uh, the other thing I, I just want to add is that inherent in all of this is he doesn't really believe in climate change. I mean, he's an anti-liberal, an anti-progressive. He doesn't believe in it. Um, so he, he's going to be unencumbered, uh, you know, philosophically um, in terms of supporting the old fossil fuel model. And I agree with you, we're going back there. And he has a lot of control. People don't realize, I'll add this one last thought, people don't realize that when a president is elected, he has the power I mean, and the custom to appoint his own department heads in every department, as well as you know, other officials like, well, the attorney general, I guess he's the head of the justice department. Um, and so, you know, what, what you have is a complete sweeping change. None of the old guys under Obama are going to be around. They're all gone. And so it's not just pronouncements from the White House, it's pronouncements from every single department. They're all going to be uh, working on different lines, uh, different policies, different approaches, different philosophies than we had over the eight years of Obama. And that's really scary. And furthermore, uh, he's going to have his way with those appointments because in a Republican um, Congress, they'll consent to everybody he finds. And he'll find some people 
um, that that will be really objectionable to the you know liberal establishment. I might add, by the way, it's very interesting that the names that he's been throwing out uh, to take these positions are the very same names he was criticizing in the campaign. I mean, names from Wall Street, um, names from capital concentrations. Uh, it's the it's the old boys back again. Didn't he say he didn't like the old boys? They're coming back. Uh, and, and as a result, I think we're going to have old boys, um, and they're going to be working for him, just at different uh, musical chairs. I think um, what I read recently is that there are somewhere around 4,000 uh, political appointee appointments uh, that are kind of key positions across the federal bureaucracy of which Oh, was it a hundred or a couple of hundred are subject to to Senate confirmation? But you're you're absolutely right that so much of a incoming presidential administration is essentially a, a house cleaning of the old regime, and you've got various institutions, think tanks, corporate entities that you go to as as your bench, essentially, right, to be able to fulfill all these positions and of course one individual can't choose a couple hundred people that he or she may know personally necessarily they've got to rely on advisors the likes of you know chris christie governor of new jersey right he was one of them yes of yes uh, rudy giuliani yes. uh good old uh, newt gingrich and and others so it's uh it, it's going to be interesting to see who, who he taps into. And I think one of the things that's so striking to me, just to go a little bit macro-political, Jay, is the actual vote breakdown, uh, which I've been pouring over based on uh, these ex exit polls on 24,000 or so uh, individuals who were interviewed, so a fairly large sample size, is that uh, Mr. Trump didn't do all that much better, only a couple percentage points better than, than Romney did in terms of the white vote. But uh, he clearly dominated amongst older Americans, essentially age 40 and up, and, uh, and other various demographic groups. And even though from 2012, when 72% of the electorate was white, to 70% to being white in this last election this past uh, Tuesday, uh, so, you know, the minorities are on the march, essentially, in terms of increasing the, the portion of their size of the electorate. But one of the, I guess, you know, the big takeaways to me is that this is uh, uh, the, the white, uh, white voters, which are still, of course, the dominant percentage, are, um, are reasserting or an attempt to reassert their, their voice, their dominance, after the perception that uh, somehow they got, you know, thrown off the bus or thrown under the bus or thrown off the train, whatever metaphor you want to use in the past eight years. So, uh, you know, where it's going to go, uh, one, one can only guess. And then you, you contrast that, looking at, a, at our beautiful Aloha state, with the fact that the one Republican, the one sole lonely Republican in the Hawaii State Senate, good old Sam Slum, he was defeated. So we have the only state Senate in the entire country that is completely controlled by one party, in this case, all 25 state senators are Democrats. And then on the House side, there are 51 members here in Hawaii, and they lost one seat, so there are now 45 Democrats on the House side and all of six Republicans. So, And, of course, Hawaii voted overwhelmingly, as did California, and to a lesser extent, Oregon and Washington. We voted overwhelmingly for Hillary Rodham Clinton. So it's, it's a real... Uh, contrast uh, between what uh, the majority of the country voted for in the Electoral College and, by the way, last I looked just a few hours ago, Jay, the, the popular vote uh, is, is still coming in. It's 94 or so percent tabulated so far. But at e every time in the past several days that the vote has been recalculated, uh, Hillary has increased increased her lead in the popular vote so now she is up by about 400,000 over Trump and like I said over the past days that has actually been increasing so it's just um, I, I read you know, that it was millions I think it was it was I saw recently uh, it was like she had two million more votes than he did um, um, in, no, in the popular vote 
It's but, only about 400000 It's not $2 million. Mm. Okay, well, whatever it is, um, this, this puts into question the Electoral College, which has seemed archaic for a long time. But I don't see any prospect for that to get fixed and the Constitution to be changed on the Electoral College anytime soon. Well, consider this. Consider this, Jay. I mean, now we've had two votes in the pa amongst the past five, two presidential elections amongst the past five presidential elections, 40 percent, in other words, where the popular vote winner in the first case, Al Gore in 2000, and now apparently Hillary Clinton, we have instances of the popular vote winner not being the electoral college vote winner. So how many more times do we have to go through this before there is some type of bona fide credible movement to change the, the electoral system when it comes to choosing chief, chief executive. I don't know. It's not but, likely I mean, to happen. Times we have to go through this? It's not likely to happen in, a, in an administration which is um, Republican, which, which benefited by, by the Electoral College. Uh, it's not likely to happen in an administration that's Republican, both in the executive and the legislative branches. Um, they're going to favor the Electoral College because it did them a good turn. But let me add this one thing. You talk about the popular vote, uh, you know, that... that favors uh, Hillary uh, Clinton, but the, but the electoral, uh, and, be, you know, that's, that's too bad because the electoral college stood in the way of the popular vote prevailing, um, but the electoral college did not stand in the way of all those seats that were given to Republicans in the, in the Congress. So um, the electoral college argument only works on the presidential level. It doesn't work on Congress, and clearly the Republicans prevailed in Congress. Well, and that's due to the annual, or excuse me, the, the census that is mandated in the Constitution, if I'm not mistaken, uh, to take place once every 10 years. Uh, so at once every 10 years, there's so-called redistricting, right, based on the movement of population from county to county or state to state, both diminishing and increasing. And it, it, ever since electoral districts have been carved up going back to the beginning of the republic politics has been involved so you have essentially the creation of of these incredible gerrymandered so-called gerrymandered districts which are really wacky when you look on them in a map and they're designed to maximize the the chances of the dominant power power do, dominant party in power in terms of maintaining yeah. their the, the the strength of their of their their candidates yeah. and their their positions I wish I could say it happens in uh, Hawaii, but we don't have any Republicans here, so it's not that way. <laughs> it may happen in Isn't individual so legislative wild? races. <laughs> well, you know, I, mean, really, you know that... I, I wanted to ask you in our remaining time, which isn't very much, I wanted to ask you how, how this all affects Hawaii, how it affects, for example, ProVision Solar, how it affects the solar installer industry, how it affects our, you know, our initiative to get to clean energy by 100% by uh, 2045. Um, it sounds like this is going to stand in the way because the federal gov government is, always has a hand in energy. Um, but what, what, is, what else is going to you know, change here, and what can we do about it? Well, I mean, of course, it's uh, the easy but completely unsatisfying answer is that it's way too early to, to say. But I, I think to, to some degree we are isolated uh, here in, in more ways than one, of course, not just geographically, but isolated to some degree from whatever uh, sometimes takes place 5,000 plus miles away in Washington, D.C., or that beautiful capital of our great country. I mean, as far as moving towards the greater energy independence, I have a hard time seeing how, how uh, a, uh, a Republican administration could really affect that all that tangibly unless, as I said earlier, they were to, the Republicans uh, in the White House and in the Congress, were to be successful in removing, you know, one of the few really tangible incentives that we have here, which of course is the 30% federal investment tax credit. If that were to go away, that would be, uh, you know, I don't want to talk too much of an apocalyptic sense, uh, but that would really, really be bad news. So, uh, but other than that, I mean, we have the economic... Uh, imperative here uh, and other reasons to develop our own indigenous energy sources so that the state can be more energy secure, more food secure, 
And uh, I just, uh, I guess I'll, you know, I'm sitting here talking to you, Jay. We're talking about these very weighty matters of uh, both the head and the heart. Well, you know, it's, I'm a, looking it's a nice answer, you know, and I appreciate you're willing to go out and, and answer it. But let me add this, that everything is connected to energy, everything. The economy, for example, connected to energy, and, and that's a, a, a sort of a reciprocal connection. The economy affects energy, energy affects the economy. Uh, it's a huge interdependence of various factors. And if this administration screws up the economy, uh, for example, this one example, that's going to screw up energy. Um, and the same thing, I think, goes on the environmental side, environmental issues, which I don't think Donald Trump is going to pay too much attention to environment. So all in all, I mean, I, your, your initial reaction was probably the best one. Sorry, Marco, it's too early to tell. <laughs> yeah, but uh, well, what I was uh, wanted to just kind of close with is that I'm, as I'm talking to you, I mean, I'm sitting here on the, this couch in this house that I'm renting here on Molokai, and I'm looking across the channel as the, the, the white caps are kicking up because the trades start usually about this time in the morning to Lanai, beautiful Lanai, the former Pineapple Island way back when in, in the distance there. And so the, the wind is blowing, the trees and the leaves are, are rustling, and and it's, it's a very peaceful, wonderful place to be in like so many parts of our wonderful state, and yet it is at the same time can be so discombobulating, to say the least, as we think about the more macro issues that are addressing, uh, that we're faced with both on a national level, on a global level, on a planetary level. So uh, the risk of getting too cosmic on you, I'll, I'll stick by my words, Your Honor. Okay, got it. So uh, anyway, I want to add one last irony, and the irony was this week was special in the sense that uh, the uh, Chamber of Commerce of Germany out of uh, Los Angeles arranged uh, a group of um, energy industry and political officials uh, and academic uh, energy people to come over here from Germany and tell us their experience in clean energy. It was a very good conference. It was all day on Wednesday. We have footage of it, which we'll make into not one, but two OC16 movies. And the, and the huge irony is that uh, these people uh, you know, are into clean energy, and they are wondering whether the U.S. is actually going to be able to do anything in clean energy uh, in the next administration. But <clears throat> it was a good conference anyway, even in the shadow of that election, which happened only the day before. Thank you, Marco. Been great to talk to you. Let's do it again soon. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to personally send you a, a, a free copy of Skype so we can have a more animated discussion. What do you think? Well, as long as I'm having a good hair day. <laughs>